flying on Pan American flight number 001. It was a jumbo jet. It just happened that as we walked on, the captain was standing there welcoming the guests, and I recognized him. He was a very good friend of another very, of a, of a very good friend of mine. So as we were flying from San Francisco, California, to Tokyo, Japan, he sent down the purser to call me and I went up in the cockpit. I must have spent about four to four and a half hours with him there in the cockpit. For me, it was really very interesting to see the display of instruments in the cockpit of one of those jumbo jets, 747 Boeings. I thought it was extremely interesting. However, as I talked to the captain, he explained a few things put the big ship on automatic pilot, sat back, crossed his legs, and he said, what a boring profession I chose. Boring, I said. Most of us think that this is perhaps one of the most uh, interesting professions you could have chosen. Oh, don't let anybody kid you. If it were not for the takeoff and landings, he said, I'd give up the job. Well, we had nearly eight hours in that huge aircraft. We sat there and talked. I could see, normally, it could be a very boring experience. I was almost shocked when he turned to me during the lull in the conversation and he said, you know, sometimes I've actually wished that we'd have a hijacking to break the monotony says, you know, they've never shot a pilot, they've never killed, no, no hijackers ever killed a pilot. And I've been so bored sitting up here sometimes, I just wish we could have had a hijacking. But he said, I suppose in your work, you don't get uh, very bored. You must have a much more interesting profession than I. Yes, dear friends, I agree with him. The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse 20, Ye are ambassadors for Christ. And as an ambassador for Christ, during the last 33 years since I graduated from this institution, I can't remember having been bored in my service for him, not even once. It's a privilege to serve the Master. It's a wonderful privilege to know that you're working for the right company. And I'd like to share with you this evening one of the rare privileges that I had. I don't suppose there are very many people that have had the chance of becoming intimately acquainted with a king. I'm not talking about the king of kings now, an earthly king. When I first graduated from Helderberg, I was sent up to the little country of Rwanda, where I now work, in the same area at least, at that time, the country of Rwanda was ruled by the seven-footer Watutsis. The king of the Watutsis, the king of Rwanda, was a very, impers a very impressive person. Uh, I'm only six feet, but as I stood there beside him on many occasions, looking up to him, I really felt more like a pygmy. Very well-built, big man, tall, well-filled out. And most people seem to think that he was very, very cold and austere. Yes, there was a certain amount of that because the Watutsis on the whole are very stoical, very, uh, very prim and proper. They are the uh, aristocrats of Central Africa. They are born leaders. Although the political situation has changed now, back in those days, he was the ruler. Although I never saw him actually exercise the power of his word, life or death, he had it. His father had used it on many occasions. I've seen uh, a number of the victims that his father had decided to punish for some mere offense, some trifling offense. There's a man I used to know very well who had to have a, a guide all the time. 
He had uh, given uh, wrong advice at the, at, the, at the wrong time. So this particular king, who became a very close friend of mine, his father had decreed that this man must have his eyes gouged out for that small offense. This man used to go around with a rag around his face, being led by one of his servants. But the king I'm referring to, Charles Mutara III, Rudahigwa, was living in a little more modern times. He had been ruling at the time that I met him for 22 years. I became acquainted with him shortly after I graduated from Helderberg. And uh, during the 15 years uh, that I knew him, we got to be very, uh, very close. Uh, he used to uh, leave his queen, who they were both Catholics. Quite often he'd come out to our Gitwe mission station, Gitwe College today, it's known as, on a Sunday, for example, just to visit, just to talk things over with eight or ten cars. They'd have to park out there for four or five hours while he, he and I sat in there and visited. And he'd often say, well, I put the queen uh, over at the Catholic mission. She's interested in mass, but I'm not. I'd much rather visit with you than uh, go to mass. After two, sometimes three, sometimes four hours, he'd go on back. He'd say, well, I've got to go and pick her up now. But uh, it was a very interesting experience getting to be intimately acquainted with him. On one occasion, a buffalo had, a rogue bull buffalo had killed one of his men out in an isolated area in northern Rwanda along the Kagera River where today there is the Kagera National Park. The king sent over a messenger. Would I please bring my rifle and help him chase down, hunt down this rogue buffalo bull who had just killed one of his herders of one of the big herds of King's Longhorn cattle. Even the Longhorn cattle of Texas, they say, didn't stand a chance beside those Longhorn cattle of the Watutsis. Fantastic spreads of horns. We went on this hunt. This buffalo is a very dangerous beast. As we were following, the buffalo charged the side where the king was and would certainly have gotten him before the king could have gotten his rifle into position to fire. But again, the Lord was gracious. I was able to drop the buffalo bull just before he got to the king. The king never forgot that. He said, you saved my life. That made us even a little closer. Our bonds of friendship grew even stronger. But I noticed his personality was changing. As the years went on, the pressures from the Belgians, the colonial rulers at that time, uh, political pressures, uh, they, were, they were trying to upset the Watutsi regime that had been in power for 32 generations, over 600 years. There were only 10% of the Watutsi, whereas the other population was about 90% the other tribe, and so the cry started back there a few years ago, majority rule. And so the Belgians were trying to arrange things so as to completely upset the Watutsi rule and put in the Wahutu, who now rule Rwanda. And I could see my friend was becoming uh, almost a different personality. The pressures were so strong on him one evening, just about dark, there was a whole line of cars. There must have been 12 or 14 cars that drove up that main road, up uh, to, to the Gitwe station. Uh, we hadn't expected anybody. There had been no announcement that we were going to have uh, the distinguished visitor that we realized was approaching. It was the Queen Mother, the king to whom I have referred, Mother, who, according to Watutsi custom, reigned jointly with her son. And theoretically, she had every bit as much power as did the ruling king, the king and the Queen Mother together. 
ruled the country of Rwanda. And here the queen came. I've made her acquaintance on many occasions. Uh, she got out of her car, walked up to our humble cottage. We invited her in. There were the usual exchanges of greetings. And after a few minutes, uh, I could sense she was very concerned about something. After just a few minutes, she said, uh, uh, Pastor, uh, could I see you privately, please? So we went into my little office behind, and this Queen Mother of Rwanda poured out her heart, her soul, to me. The burden of her soul was her son, King Mutara II Rudahigwa. As she explained to me what had happened just the weekend before, three or four days before, this stately lady actually broke down and wept. And it was against all custom for the Watutsis to show any emotion. Weeping was completely out of their vocabulary. They were not allowed to cry. But as the Queen Mother pointed out to me, she said, the king, my son, has been seen in public drunk on two occasions. This was unheard of. The Watutsis with their dignity and their sense of rulership would, could not, absolutely could not be seen drunk in public. And this mother said, Pastor, you're the only one I know of that can help me to help the king of Rwanda. As I mentioned before, they were both very good Catholics. Uh, I suggested to her that she go to the Catholic bishop. Oh, she said, he has even been seen drunk in public. How could he help my son? I sensed the responsibility of such a thing as she was requesting. It was a heavy responsibility. Although we were good friends, yet to speak to the ruling king on such a personal item as his personal drinking habits could very easily flip the fuse. And I realized that our entire work in Rwanda could be in jeopardy that part of the country where we have so much work. As I mentioned yesterday, perhaps the densest Adventist population of any country in Africa. I realized that all of these things were at stake. What should I do? Here was a request. This queen mother beseeching me, imploring that I do something, that I speak to her son, that somehow or other I help her and help him to realize the terrible condition in which he had, to which he had sunk to have been seen drunk in public on two different occasions. As she pled with me, I said, Your Highness, Your Excellency, please give me one day. I will come over to your palace tomorrow evening at this time and give you my reply. Oh, please, Pastor, please. Please, you are the only one that can help my son. You are the only one that can save Rwanda. Much of that night was spent in prayer. The next day we counseled with some of our senior pastors seeking advice. We didn't know really just what way, which way we should turn. I remember the next morning as five of us pastors gathered together, I read this beautiful promise in this wonderful little book, Steps to Christ, where the spirit of prophecy tells us, take to him in prayer everything that perplexes the mind. Nothing is too great for him to bear. For he holds the world. He rules over the affairs of the universe. 
nothing that in any way concerns your peace is too small for him to notice. There is no chapter in our experience too dark for him to read. There is no perplexity too difficult for him to unravel. What a precious promise. No perplexity too difficult for him to unravel. And as the five of us pastors prayed together, seeking the Lord's guidance, again the assurance came, Go, and I will be with thee. The following, that evening, I went over to the Queen Mother's palace, told her that I would be glad. If she would arrange the appointment, I would be glad to go and visit with her son. She said, can you make it tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock? I said, whenever you say. The appointment was set for the next day at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. As I drove up that afternoon to the front of the king's palace, the queen mother had her palace separately, the king had his separately. She had arranged for me to meet him at his palace, not in his office. Those stately Watutsi guards, some with rifles, some with spears, standing there, as you came in the front entrance, you would have to walk down a line of about 50 or 55 of these stately palace guards. What a thrill to be an ambassador for the King of Kings. To present that little card which the King had given me many years before, just a little card known very well by each of those palace guards, by just flashing that little card, those stately men would jump to attention and salute as the ambassador for the King of Kings walked down their row. I was met at the front door by one of the servants. I had only once before been ushered into the inner sanctum. There was the large room uh, in the palace about half the size of the uh, church here, which was the general meeting place, when the chiefs, the paramount chiefs, 50 of them were called in, that's where they would have their council. Then you go through a passage, back behind was another room about a quarter the size of the main room. I'd been in there several times. But then on beyond, through a narrow little passageway, with four doors through which you had to go, was the inner sanctum. Not the first one that met me at the door was allowed to take me into the inner sanctum. Each room had a guide. I was taken through the one room by the man who met me at the gate, then through the second little room by another man, and at that place I had to wait about two or three minutes until the third guide opened up these doors and took me into the inner sanctum where I was shown a seat. There were only four chairs, plush. The room was ornate, ivory, ebony, copper, displayed very profusely. I was shown a seat. In about one minute, the king came in from another door. He was very casual, very relaxed. sat down beside me as I stood of course when he came in asked me to sit down beside him we chatted on just the run of the day topics for about 10 minutes and then the king said to me my mother has told me that she has requested you to come here on a special errand I know not what your errand is but I would like to hear about it. You know, dear young friends, that promise, give no thought of what ye shall say, for in that day it shall be given unto you 
was wonderfully, marvelously fulfilled in my behalf. Although I had spent much time in prayer, I had in fact tried to memorize something I, I never do or very seldom do, tried to memorize what I was supposed to say, to, to say it just in the right way, so as not to make a mistake. But all that memory work was in vain, was for nothing. I could sense the powerful and the sweet spirit of the King of Kings in our presence as I talked. Things I'd never thought about, approaches that had never entered my mind before, came to me as I spoke to that king, pointing out that the only hope for him as king of Rwanda was to submit to the king of kings and to let his maker, to let his creator give him the victory over alcohol. He admitted, very frankly, he says, for over a year now, the pressures of the affairs of state have been more than I could manage. Yes, I have done something that has embarrassed the nation. I have done something for which I am ashamed. But at first he said, I have tried to give it up. I cannot give it up. It has thrown its chains around me, he said. I am helpless. No, King, I said, you are not helpless. The God whom we love, the God whom we serve, I said, is able to give you the victory. He will give you the victory. If you submit, if you just ask him, he will give you the victory over alcohol. On one other occasion, I had requested or I had suggested that perhaps the king would like me to pray with him. That was an occasion when I knew he was under particular pressure. I knew he was going through a very difficult time. I, would, I had been called to his office and I had offered to pray for him in his office. Very politely, he had said, no, friend, you are a Protestant, I am a Catholic. Please pray for me in your home or in your church, but not here. I didn't know what the, suge what the suggestion on my part uh, to allow, to request him if he would like me to pray for him, what, what reaction he would have on this particular occasion. But I felt so impressed that I must again ask him, even though I faced the possibility of a, another rejection, I suggested to him, King, the only one that can give you the victory is God. Would you care for me to pray for you this afternoon? He extended his hand. Yes, Pastor, pray for me. We got down on our knees. I didn't know whether he would kneel or not. I got on my knees and he followed my example. I put my arm around his shoulders as I prayed. Dear friends, what a privilege it is to feel the power of God. That huge man, the King of Rwanda, as I prayed I could feel his entire body shaking, trembling under the mighty influence of the power of God whose spirit was present in a wonderful measure on that occasion. When I arose, he arose. And I saw something that I never thought I would see in, a, in any Watutsi, let alone the king. Tears were rolling down his cheeks, quite contrary to custom, completely contrary to his habits. He was weeping. As I shook his hand and assured him of victory, he said, yes, pastor, yes, friend, 
I feel that God has completely removed from me the desire of drink. With your prayers and with his help, I will not touch it again. Three weeks ago, I visited his queen. She still lives. But as we were visiting in her home up in Rwanda three weeks ago, she reminded me of this experience. Unfortunately, politics being what they are, only a few weeks later, the king was done away with. But as I talked to the ex-queen three weeks ago, she said, Pastor, something happened to the king of Rwanda after you had prayed with him that I never thought could happen. Although he only had about seven weeks from that time until his death, she said he never once even asked for any drink. At some of the large assemblies of state, when he uh, actually uh, should have had perfect right to take the the social cup, as it were, the social glass. She told me he used to ask for orange aid, and he would always be given orange aid. What a victory. And what a privilege to have had a little part in helping that king learn about the wonderful power of his creator. Although he did not accept everything like you and I have accepted in our church, still I have the conviction that when we get up there on those streets of gold, we will see that stately king. I am assured, as the testimony of his private secretary, a man whom I knew very well, the testimony of his wife, the queen, the testimony of several, said that man was a totally different man for the last seven weeks of his life. Dear young friends, my God doesn't change. That same power that was available that afternoon when the king of Rwanda was trembling like a leaf in the wind under the conviction of the Spirit of God is still available for me today. I need it. It's still available for you, dear young friend. And the promise that we have here in Philippians, the third chapter, verse 21, talking about our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, the end of verse 20, verse 21 I read, Who shall change our vile body? that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things. What a promise. He is able to subdue all things, to change this vile body of mine. I've never been tempted with alcohol. But as a boy, I used to have a pretty vile temper. And uh, one or two of my roommates discovered it when I was here at Helderberg. I'm embarrassed to say that two or three of my teachers discovered it. But dear young friends, thank the Lord. He has given me the victory over that vile temper. Is it a vile temper? that bothers you? Is it perhaps some vile, filthy language that tempts you? Is it perhaps some vile literature? The wrong friends? And you just don't seem to have the G-U-T-S to say no? I don't know what it is. Each one of us has our own problems. 
But dear friends, I can assure you from experience and from the promise of the King of Kings that he is able to subdue all things in your life, to give you the victory, that same power that changed that king of Rwanda so that his private secretary who worked very closely with him told me after his death he said that man was completely changed who shall change our vile body so that it is fashioned after his glorious body for he is able to subdue all things I take courage this evening, even though I do stumble and fall sometimes, yet I know my God is a wonderful God. He is able. Philippians 4, the next chapter, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Paul wasn't bragging, but he knew his God. He knew Jesus Christ his Savior he knew that through Christ he could gain the victory therefore he wrote here not in a braggadocia not in any self exaltation but he said I can do all things through Christ but we need to surrender we need to submit Christ will do everything but there's one thing he will not do he will not force you. He's never forced me. You must choose. We're not machines. We're human beings. We have the privilege and the power of choice. We have to choose. We have to decide. And sometimes it's very difficult. But if we only choose, all you need to say is, Dear Lord, I place my will in thine hand. I place my hand in thy hand. Give me the victory. Bless me, dear Jesus. Give me that overcoming power that you had over Satan. It was at Songa Mission Hospital that I was acting as an interpreter for one of our doctors. Maybe some of you people know Dr. Ron Grant who is now in California, but who for several years worked in the mission field and in the Johannesburg area. Dr. Ron Grant was the medical director of our Songa Mission Hospital. He had not been there very long when my wife and I visited Ron and Mary Grant. One evening, we heard an unusual amount of excitement, noise down at the hospital, then one of the medical attendants came up to call the doctor. We went down there. The doctor had one of these uh, pressure lamps uh, lit. We went down. They had just brought in a man who had been caught by a leopard five days before. This leopard had literally chewed his left arm to shreds. And that left arm had become rotten. It was difficult to talk, to lean, to kneel down there beside this little crude stretcher on which they had brought in this poor man. The stench was appalling. It didn't take the doctor very long. I was interpreting for him. He said, please tell this man, I must take off his arm. There is a chance. I think we can save him, but he must allow me to amputate that arm. As I told this African that, even though he was weakened in that condition in which he found himself, he, he sat right up in his stretcher. He said, cut off my arm? Never! Never! No, tell the doctor to give me an injection. Tell the doctor to give me some medicine. Oh, they have a lot of faith in injections. Tell the doctor. He, he, there he was sitting with his one right arm. He couldn't move this one, of course, but he was going through very, very definite instructions telling the doctor what to do. The doctor said, I'm very sorry, friend. You must decide. Either you let me take off your arm and you will live 
but you will have only one arm. You'll have your right arm. You can live quite happily. And we worked with that man for nearly an hour, trying to persuade him to let the doctor take off that rotten, stinking piece of his body that didn't even resemble an arm. He said, I'll let you know in the morning. I must talk to my father. The doctor said I should take that off tonight. No, never tonight. Not tonight. Tomorrow morning I'll let you know. The next morning we were down there as soon as it was light enough for the doctor to be able to see the operating instruments in the operating theater. The doctor asked me, do you think he'll, do you think he'll agree? I said, I'm afraid not, doctor. Again, we labored with that man. We persuaded, we told him. The doctor said, you will be dead in less than two days. You will be gone unless you let me take off that arm. I would rather die than have you take off my arm. How could I face my five wives with only one arm? <laughs> we laugh at it because it sounds so stupid. But dear friends, are you or am I clinging on to a rotten piece of the devil's temptation in our lives? Which we know will keep us from going into eternal life? The next evening, that man was dead. Are we willing to let the great physician do the necessary amputation in our lives during this week of prayer. Yes, dear friends, the promise is very clear. He can change our vile bodies to resemble his glorious one. Are you planning for eternity? Or are you just planning for a few short, brief years in this devil-controlled world of ours? It can't be much longer, dear young friends. Let's not hang on to those vile tempers, those other things that do so easily beset us, but with confidence say, Yes, Lord, please take me, cleanse me, create within me a new heart, renew a spirit, or thy spirit within me. Give me, dear Lord, the victory that I need. And dear young friends, I can assure you that same power that helped that king overcome the terrible habit of alcohol is at your disposition. I have proved my God. I know he keeps his promises. He will keep it in your behalf as he has in mine.